Welcome to People Expert. My name is Tom and I'll be presenting the Principles of Flight course. This course is designed to give you an in-depth understanding on the theory of cards past the CAA theory exam for this particular topic. Despite this, own self-study, commitment and discipline will be required. The course is displayed in the form of a slideshow which I'll be talking through. Please feel free to pause the recording at any point to either take a break or write down any notes. So it's important to understand uh, that every single aircraft, no matter what size or shape, whether it's a small glider, a training aircraft, or a much larger commercial jet, all have the same basic principles, or require the same basic, basic principles in order for them to fly. So we'll be looking at the differences between the different aircraft and how those basic principles differ between size and shape. So what will we be looking at? We'll be looking at how an aeroplane harnesses natural forces to create flight, how air is characterised as a fluid, we'll study the passing of an object in its aerodynamics, and then understanding of principles of flight to ensure safe flying. The specific subjects which we will cover are the atmosphere, which are also covered in other PPL expert topics, forces acting upon an aircraft, weight, lift, drag, stability, the propeller itself, controllability and flight dynamics. So we'll go through each of these separate topics and see that how it affects us and uh, what we what's required for the exam and what the kind of questions they may ask us. An air mass is often described as acting like a fluid and it's the act uh, described like this because its pressure acts equal in all directions so no matter what force is put upon it the pressure will be equal in every single direction and that's also known as static pressure the pressure around it. As we go up in altitude both the static pressure and the density of that air mass will decrease. In the troposphere, which is the lower portion of the atmosphere from the ground up to around 36,000 feet, where the tropical pause is, uh, as we go up in altitude, we're going to have a drop in temperature as our altitude increases. We're also going to have a drop in pressure and air density as well, as stated above. Okay, so you see by the diagram, if we go down in altitude, so an air mass is traveling towards the ground, our density is going to increase, so we're going to get air more air molecules per unit of air and also our static pressure is also going to increase as well. So now we're going to look at some of the forces which act upon an aircraft. Now we all know that uh, an aircraft has a mass, it has uh, it weighs something, but once this mass is acted upon by gravity it's no longer known as a mass and it becomes known as a weight. So mass plus the gravity force is weight. The weight of an aircraft is supported by its opposing force which is lift or something known as ground reaction which are the two the same thing. So the force opposing weight and mass is lift. Now before we look at different forces acting on the plane in more detail, we need to learn some particular datums and some theories which we must remember. And the first one is the International Standard Atmosphere, also known as ISA, and again this is covered in different P uh, people expert topics as well. And what the International Standard Atmosphere is a datum which has been created uh, to which we can reference the atmosphere uh, to the International Standard Atmosphere, so it gives us a comparison. And what the International Standard Atmosphere assumes is, is a certain, some certain parameters based at sea level. So at sea level it assumes that the temperature is plus 15 degrees Celsius, the pressure is 1013 hectopascals, and the density of the air is 1.225 kilograms per meters cubed. Okay, it assumes this, and what we can do is assess our atmosphere in real in what's happening 
at the moment compared to the datum and that can give us some indication uh, for many things. It also assumes a lapse rate so for every thousand feet we go up in altitude that the temperature is going to drop around uh, 2 degrees. Okay, Exactly it's 1.98 but we round up to 2 degrees. So very rarely the temperature is actually ISA and all of these conditions are ISA. So if, it is, if it's something different from what the international standard atmosphere is it will be known as an ISA deviation and we'll look at that next. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, so the first question is, what is the ISA temperature at 8,000 feet? Well, we know that as we go to every 1,000 feet up, our temperature drops 2 degrees. So 8,000 feet, the temperature is going to drop 16 degrees. Okay. Now, ISA assumes at sea level, the temperature is 15 degrees Celsius. So at 8,000 feet, assuming an ISA temperature lapse rate, the temperature will be minus 1. Okay, so that's quite a Straightforward one. This next question is an ISA deviation question. And it says the temperature at 9,000 feet is minus 9 degrees Celsius. What is the ISA deviation? Well, first of all, we need to work out what the temperature would be in ISA. So if we're 9,000 feet up at 2 degrees per 1,000 feet, we know that there's an 18 degrees uh, difference between our sea level and 9,000 feet. So 15 minus our 18 is minus 3. So assuming ISA, the ice temperature should be minus 3. However, it's told us that it's actually minus 9. Okay, and you can see that's a difference of 6. So the ISA deviation is minus 6 degrees. So it's 6 degrees colder than ISA. So that's another kind of sample question you may get asked, is to, to work out what the ISA deviation is. So there's four main forces that act on an aircraft during flight. So the first one is thrust, which is what propels an aircraft in a forward direction. Then we have the opposing force to thrust, which is drag, and that's op that acts in the opposite direction to the thrust. Okay, so it's the force opposing it. Then we have lift, which is required to keep an aircraft airborne, and that's produced mainly by the wings, the aerofoils and the lift is opposed by weight which is its opposing force okay so we've got the four main forces and two of the they act two of them each act perpendicular to one another and the other two act perpendicular to another so when these particular forces are in balance it's the aircraft can be described as being in equilibrium so if the aircraft is flying in straight and level, so it's not deviating in direction or altitude, the lift force will balance the weight force, which means it's not going to climb and descend, and the thrust is also going to balance the drag, Okay, so it's not increasing or decreasing in speed, and that's known as equilibrium. If it's in equilibrium, the aircraft will continue indefinitely unless it's acted upon a certain way, and this sort of covers Newton's first law which is an object remains in the same state of motion unless a resultant force acts on it. If the resultant force on an object is zero, this means a stationary object stays stationary. So if any, unless any force is acted upon the aircraft, it's going to stay exactly where it is. So as we've already previously mentioned, weight is the result of a mass plus the uh, value of gravity. And the weight acts through uh, a central point known as the centre of gravity, which uh, can be moved within the aircraft, and that will be gone through in more detail in the flight planning and performance uh, section of PPO Expert about how we calculate where the centre of gravity is and how we can also move it if need be. But all weight acts through this central point. So now we're going to look at something called wing loading and what it is. Now wing loading is described as the weight which is supported per unit area of the wing. So basically how much load is subjected to a portion of the wing. So how much stress is the wing under. Okay, And the more lift is required, the more wing loading is subjected to that particular wing. Now there's a way that we can work it out. For instance, uh, it's this equation where wing loading equals the weight of the aircraft divided by the wing area. 
So what we're trying to work out is how much weight is subjected to a portion of the wing. So the example below gives us a, an aircraft with a wing area of 20 square meters and the mass is 1,220 kilograms. And if we divide the mass by the wing area, it gives us an answer of 61 kilograms per square meter. Now this is important because some aircraft have a limitation on how much wing loading that can endure. So we need to be aware of that in the limitations. Effectively, the higher the wing loading, the more stress the aircraft's going to be under. So now we're going to start to look at the aerodynamics of how an aircraft flies, or how lift is produced, but there's still a couple of theorems that we need to be aware of. Okay, so the first one is known as streamline flow. And what that is, is when air molecules follow a st the same steady path in a flow, so the, a continuous movement. And there's something known as laminar flow, and that's basically a streamline, and it's described on an aircraft as it, uh, or desirable on an aircraft as it offers optimum efficiency and the least amount of drag. If we have an aircraft that can't offer a streamlined path, then behind the uh, the front of the wing, what can happen is a very turbulent airflow. Now, what you've got to imagine the two diagrams below are examples of a wing profile. The first one you can see it's a nice oval shape and the air molecules are pushed around the aerofoil uh, smoothly and that's that laminar flow and although it's pushed around it the air doesn't become very turbulent. Whereas on the second picture behind that square it's a very abrupt uh, force for the airflow so it has nowhere to go and you can see behind that leading edge if this is a cross profile of an aerofoil it, behind that leading edge is a very turbulent airflow which isn't ideal for flying okay so it's just being aware of st what stream uh, streamline flow is and it's uh, that laminar flow where the air molecules are flying in a steady optimum path which is the best for efficiency so next we're going to look at the Bernoulli theorem or theory and the Bernoulli theorem looks at a body of air moving through a venturi. Now venturi is a constricting tube or pipe so it gets narrower in diameter and if a body of air moves through a venturi uh, it's going to change state. So the dynamic pressure, so the speed of the air will increase, the static pressure, so the pressure exerted on the outside force will decrease and the temperature will decrease as well. And his theorem states that pressure energy is equal to kinetic energy, which is also equal to the constant total energy. So it's important to remember the theorem and what happens to a body of air as it moves through a venturi, and that will form the basis of how an aerofoil uh, creates lift and makes an aircraft fly. So next we're going to look at dynamic pressure and how that can change. So the dynamic pressure is the air molecules hitting the aircraft, so the speed of them. And as we increase our airspeed, dynamic pressure will increase. Also, the greater the air density, the higher the dynamic uh, pressure as well. So a good example of this is if we stick our hand out of a car window at a slow speed, uh, what will happen is we won't feel much force, but as we go faster, Again, if we stick our hand out the window, we will feel more of that dynamic pressure, the airflow hitting our hand. And as we come lower in altitude, there's more air molecules for a parcel of air, which will cause that dy dynamic pressure to be greater. As our velocity increases, so our dynamic pressure uh, increases, the static pressure around us will decrease. So here's a cross-sectional area of an aerofoil. You can see a whole aircraft here, the fuselage, uh, where the uh, cockpit is, the engine, and also the wing. And the cross-sectional area of the wing is that teardrop-shaped, what it looks like from a side view. So now we're going to look at the aerofoil itself, as the wing is the device that produces lift for an aircraft. So we'll look at different names of components of it, and how then the wing produces lift. So what is a basic aerofoil? So the aerofoil is a shape which, if subjected to the correct conditions, will create some kind of lift. There's many different cross-sections.